Okay, thank you very much for the um, for the invitation. So yeah, as was just said, I will broaden the topics a little bit and talk about magnetism in neuroscience. So I'm a neuroscientist, so please bear in mind that I'm not a physicist and I'm also not a specialist in all the things I will present to you because neuroscience is quite a large field, as you will see. So first, a brief intro about uh, neuroscience. You could see it as a kind of subfield of biology and what biologists love to do is examine relationship between the structure of objects and their function in the body. And in neuroscience, you could imagine that at different scales, you have, of course, the main organ, which is the brain. And in this organ, you have cells, which are the most interesting ones, at least are neurons, with this canonical organization where you have dendrites that gather information coming from other neurons or from, from sensors. You have the axon hillock that integrates this information. And then the axon, which is the elongated part of the neuron that uh, allows to transmit information uh, over long distances through electrical pulses, which are called spikes. And at the end of the axon, you have synapses to transmit the information either to other neurons or to effectors like muscles. And of course, all this works thanks to biomolecules and here, the most important ones would be ion channels, right? All this neuronal electrical activity is caused by movement of ions through the membrane of the neurons uh, via these, these uh, transmembrane ion channels. If you were to try to understand the brain and how it works using just these scales, it would be a bit like trying to understand a computer while it's turned off. Uh, and what neuroscientists really love to do is actually to record the activity of neurons. And I will try to give you an example, and I hope the sound uh, will work. Uh, it's a very uh, seminal experiment in neuroscience. It's from the 60s by two researchers, Hubel and Wiesel, who got the, the Nobel Prize for it. And uh, this, uh, in this experiment, they recorded neurons in the um, primary visual cortex of the cat. So it's an area that is at the back of the, your brain. And it's the first area of cortex that receives information from the retina. And they just insert an electrode past the current uh, that, is, um, that is received through an amplifier. And that is what you will hear. You will hear a neuron. And I will show you what the cat actually uh, saw. I think this might work. Let's, let's just see. So uh, you will hear cracks, and these cracks are the neuronal spikes. Let's see. Oh, this does. No. Uh, that's too bad. I can hear them. Yeah, yeah, we can, we can hear them. Yeah, I, I know. I think it's because of the sharing options I, I picked. I, I clicked share audio, but uh, let's see. So what you see, okay, okay, this is enough. What you saw is that this neuron responds when light is presented where the scientists put the crosses here. Uh, and not only light has to be there, but it has to be in the form of this elongated bar and the bar has to be in the right orientation. So here we have neurons that are sensitive not only to the location of the light, this comes from the retina. So that's how retinas work, right? They are sensitive to where the light comes from. But here we see that already in the brain, the brain computed something and that's this orientation specificity. And that's the first step in, in, in how the visual system works. So I hope this convinced you that, yeah, it's really interesting to look at brain activity. So if we were to complete the schematic that I just did before, in neuroscience, what we want to know about is neuronal activity. And of course, what it gets really interesting is to link this neural activity to the behavior, which is the output of 
our nervous system. And of course, it's all supported by organs, networks, cells, and, and molecules. That's all well and good. The problem is that, as you saw, this type of experiment that was just done before, it's quite invasive, and it's not so good to do in, in humans, uh, especially since the brain is a very well-protected organ. As you see, you have uh, the skin of the scalp, the bones, the meninges, and only below that, the brain tissue. And of course, that's where magnetism might come to the rescue, and it provides us a few techniques that allow us to examine the brain without having to poke holes in this delicate uh, machinery. So the outline I will, uh, I will uh, follow is, the, is the, the following one. I will um, show magnetism in the neuroscience toolbox, first with uh, methods to observe the brain and its activity with magnetic resonance imaging and magnetoencephalography. Then we will see that we can also modify brain activity with transcranial magnetic stimulation. And if I have time, I will also talk about the fact that magnetism can be a neuroscience topic since some animals are sensitive to magnetic fields. So first, uh, MRI. It's probably the technique uh, people, the general public knows most. Uh, the first image of the brain was recorded with MRI in 1978. It's originally a really clinical, um, clinical uh, application. And the principle, I probably won't teach you anything, it's based on the nuclear magnetic resonance of hydrogen nuclei. Uh, and for this, you need to put the person in a big uh, static magnetic field and uh, send some radio frequency magnetic fields. The trick of MRI was to apply gradients in the magnetic field in order to get back spatial information, so where things are. And what makes MRI really interesting is that by using different sequences in the machine, you can apply different weighting to the relaxation processes and get different contrasts between tissue. So of course, this can be used for just anatomical images like this, but you will see neuroscientists have a lot of other ways to use the machine. If we stay in the anatomy, one way to uh, use MRI is, for example, to do tractography, which means to to be able to trace the path that axons take in the brain and see which areas are connected to which other areas. So this is based on diffusion temperature imaging contrasts. And here the idea is that you can detect the way that water diffuses. Uh, and when water is inside these axons, which are very elongated structures, the diffusion is anisotropic and you can detect that. So you get these uh, tensor images with these average uh, diffusion orientations and placing a seed area, you can trace with a numerical method, trace the axons between brain areas and you get maps like this, which are kind of maps of the connections between all brain areas. And this forms what we call the connectome, right? The big map of all connected brain areas. But this is still anatomical. On, on the bottom plot, uh, that's a good question, actually. I don't, uh, I don't know, maybe they are co colored by area of origin. That's what I would suspect, at least. Now, what about brain activity? Uh, well, it's possible to record something that is close to brain activity in, uh, with an MRI machine. And this is based on very old observations. The first one from the 19th century from Sherrington is that the brain is able to regulate its own blood supply, first observation. Second observation, so here we get close to magnetism by no less by Linus Pauling, which is that um, hemoglobin, so the metalloprotein of the blood which transports oxygen, changes its magnetic properties depending on whether it's carrying oxygen or whether it gave away its oxygen to, uh, to tissues. And with these two things, and the invention of MRI, we had to wait until the 90s. Uh, so for this article, which showed that with MRI, you could detect blood oxygenation and changes in blood oxygenation. What is this technique called? It's called bold contrast functional MRI. Bold stands for blood oxygen level dependent contrast. And the idea is the following. When an area, I mean, it can even be a very small region of your brain, gets active, 
uh, it, uh, it, uh, it needs more oxygen and the vascular system adapts. It actually brings more blood to this area. And the funny thing is that it, it actually brings more blood than needed. So you have more oxyhemoglobin and a decrease of deoxyhemoglobin. And this is a signal that can be recorded thanks to the magnetic properties of hemoglobin. The signal you record is something that looks like that. Um, so it, it's described by this function, this hemodynamic response function. Uh, and if you imagine a kind of uh, peak stimulus, uh, the signal lasts, you see, has a delay and lasts several seconds. So everything you record will kind of be convolved by, uh, by this function. Of course, this technique, as you can imagine, it has some limit. Oh, no, sorry. I'm in advance. So the way this works uh, is, is you record brain activity while subjects are doing a task and you put the subject in two different conditions here A and B with kind of long presentation tasks. You collect a bunch of images over a long time over several subjects. And, um, and then in the end, you just subtract the 3D images, you apply a statistical routine to see where it was significantly different. And you get what you see at the right, this activation map. So which areas were differently activated in these two different conditions. That's one way to use fMRI. The other way is called resting state fMRI. So here the subject, you put them in the scanner. They don't do anything. And you just look at the cross correlation between the bold signal in the different brain areas. And this gives you also an idea about how brain areas are connected to another. This technique has limitations, of course. First, there are bounds on the temporal and spatial resolution. Temporal, it's evident. You saw the function from before. It lasts several seconds. And spatial resolution, it's because it's a vascular mechanism, not a neuronal mechanism. It's also very sensitive to subject movement, which is, makes some, uh, some analysis difficult. And it requires a very complex uh, analysis and statistical pipeline, right? You need to remove artifacts, then take in account subject movement, align different subjects together because everyone doesn't have the same brain, and then do this complex statistical analysis. Uh, and it explains that a lot of early studies in the field were often poor, uh, poor, quality, uh, poor quality studies. And of course, there is the a million dollar question, which is, okay, we record this vascular signal, but what is actually causing, what kind of activity in the brain is causing this bold signal? Uh, what do these activation maps represent? And that's a big, uh, a big question as well. So this is, uh, oh no, yeah, the, this field is of course progressing uh, in time and the constant progress that has existed since the beginning of MRI is the increase of this static field. Currently, even commercial machines, the, the brand new ones, reach seven Tesla, uh, which is quite a feat, right? You need to put constant seven Tesla around the person. And this is the kind of image you can get. So here it's an ex vivo image of a brain uh, and the resolution is uh, 100 microns, right? 0.1 millimeter. Uh, for bold fMRI, what you get with these high field machines is increased signal to noise ratio and then better spatial resolution. What's really interesting is that the spatial resolutions we are reaching with these machines gets close to spatial resolution of actual building blocks in the brain, which wasn't the case before. These building blocks are either cortical layers, the cortex is organized in layers, or cortical columns. So cortical columns are kind of subunits of the cortex. For example, this orientation sensitivity that I showed in the intro, it's organized by these columns. And with these high field MRI machines, we are approaching these, uh, these resolutions. So it's, it's exciting times. The drawback is that the more precise you are, the more people become different and uh, it will become harder and harder to average uh, subjects uh, together. And so we might go towards individual focused fMRI studies. The drawback is that maybe you have, you need subjects to spend hours and hours in, in, the, in the scanner. Of course, with this ultra high field MRI, 
I have to mention that um, it's currently installed and probably commissioned for human use this year or, or next year, the ISO MRI machine uh, at, uh, at Neurospin, which will reach 11.7 Tesla. Last, you saw a lot of the drawbacks of this technique come from the fact that we use this bold contrast. Uh, at the end of the last year, there was quite an exciting paper uh, on mice uh, in ultra high field as well, 9.4 Tesla. And here it seems that they found a contrast that can detect something that is very close to actual neuronal activity. And they get a very, uh, very good uh, temporal resolution. They see, for example, the, the neuronal signal travel between areas as it goes and you see the scale here we're not in seconds anymore it's uh, it's milliseconds so they're not really sure where the signal comes from but the paper is quite convincing it's probably something about the properties of water molecules just around this membrane as ions go uh, go through it so that's uh, that's fMRI the main workhorse of human neuroscience Another technique that is uh, also used, but is less frequent because it has less clinical uses, so it's very specific, is magnetoencephalography, so MEG for short. Uh, and here, this technique directly records tiny magnetic fields. The idea is the following. Um, in your cortex, you can have elongated dendrites that form electrical dipoles. Uh, and if you have enough of these dendrites aligned close to another, and that enough of them are active at the same time, they generate an electric field, and this electric field induces a tiny magnetic field. And if everything is in the right orientation, so if it's, uh, if it's tangential to the, to the skull surface, then this will produce magnetic fields that can be recorded outside the skull. So the amplitude of these magnetic fields is on the order of 100 uh, nano Tesla, no, oh, femto Tesla, sorry, femto Tesla. Uh, and the idea is then to place a, a bunch of very sensitive magnetic detectors all around uh, the brain, uh, all around the skull. And in this technique, the really hard thing is source localization, is to go from the recorded magnetic field to where it was produced in the brain. And unfortunately, unfortunately it's an ill defined problem, right? You have many solutions. But with some approximations, you can get a pretty good idea. It's still not as precise as fMRI, but it's, for example, much more precise than electroencephalography, where you directly measure these electrical fields, because in EEG, the electrical fields are perturbed by the bone and by the scalp, which is not the case of uh, magnetic fields. So how do these machines uh, look like? Up until very recently, this was what you needed to do MEG. Uh, the sensors that were used were uh, superconducting quantum interference devices, squids. And so you had a big room with a 20 ton of shielding. And inside this big machine, if you, we look closer, it looks like that. So uh, you have this huge uh, cryogenic enclosure containing liquid helium to cool the around 300 sensors that were placed around the head of the subject. So right, you have pickup coils that are close to the, to the scalp and then the sensors are a bit above in the machine. So you see uh, something that is well, big, uh, not easy to, to, to run, expensive, uh, and also that is one size fits all, of course, right, this enclosure it has a fixed size, you can't adapt it to the subject. Since five years, people have been starting to use uh, a new type of sensor, which are optically pumped magnetometers. And you see size-wise, they are much nicer, around the size of a Lego brick for the second generation. And of course, they are room temperature. So uh, this was first generation, this is current generation. You can see that you can place them very close around the head of the subject have the helmet adapt to the head of the subject. And this has, of course, several advantages, right? The sensors are much closer to the brain. So even though currently the signal to noise ratio of the OPMs is not as good as squids, they still record a much larger magnetic field because they are closer. 
And one other advantage might be that you can do a triaxial recording, so record the direction of the magnetic field, which also will help for uh, source localization. No, it's like the resolution is, is centimeters, right? It's uh, Exactly, right? It, it, the fMRI would be the same, right? It averages over a population of your neurons. So you really need to have a, or of the order of several tens of thousands of neurons active at the same time and in synchronization, right? Because they need to do these oscillations for this to work. Yeah, but thanks to the organization of cortex, they, they, these dendrites, they actually are uh, parallel. But I mean, some parts are parallel, this you can de detect, and the parts that are going in every direction, then they cancel out and you can't see anything. So that's actually a big limitation of this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of machine, right? Uh, and the exciting thing is that with these, you saw that it's quite small, we might be able to go towards wearable uh, sensors. Still one big problem is that the movements of the sensor are a problem. They don't have a high dynamic range. And if you move in a magnetic field, then you record uh, the, the, these changes and the sensor saturates. So there are currently uh, approaches to know the field with active coils so with system that look like this or more recently like that. And they managed to reduce the ambient magnetic field enough that these, uh, these OPMs can be used while the subject is moving a bit. So for example, this, uh, this type of experiment where they have the subject bounce a ping pong ball on, on, uh, here on the paddle and records brain activity while the subject is doing that. It doesn't look like much, but it's insanely better than what was possible before either in MEG or MRI. And myself, I'm a movement neuroscientist and this is quite, uh, quite exciting. Now, all these techniques that I showed are correlation techniques, right? You can only look between, uh, of, uh, you can only look at the correlation between uh, behavior, a task, and brain activity. But to fully answer the scientific question, the nice thing is that you need to be able to perturb the brain activity and see uh, if this has an effect. Um, magnetism can also help us with that with the tool called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Compared to the other ones, you'll see that it's much simpler. The idea is that you have a machine that is able to generate a brief and very high uh, electrical current that is sent to a coil, right? This thing here. And if the coil, uh, the coil generates a high transient magnetic field, and if the coil is close to the brain, this induces an electric field in the brain. And this leads to perturbations of the neural activity. Uh, it looks like this. So uh, here you have the machine, here you have the coil, and here the um, experimenter um, will activate an, the only area of the brain where this machine has a visible effect, which is the motor cortex. So the area of the brain that controls your muscles. And you will see that here the hand will twitch. So the setting is pretty, pretty high on the machine. Right here, you saw the, you see the little, uh, the little contraction. If we had the sound, we would hear also that the machine makes a big clack every time it 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 uh, it, um, it sends this this pulse. And this technique can be used for in a variety of ways. So of course, we study motor cortex a lot, and in general, we don't rely on just looking at the hand of the person, we record the uh, electrical activity of the muscle and we record what is called a motor evoked potential. So the muscle contraction that is evoked by this brain stimulation. And we measure cortical activity, uh, cortical excitability, basically how easy it is to get this contraction, right? How high do we have to set the machine to get the contraction? And then we see whether, I don't know, a given, a given experiment or a given medication changes this cortical excitability. You can do also more complex things by, for example, sending several pulses in succession. So you kind of perturb the network with the first pulse 
and then try to get a motor evoked potential with a stronger second pulse. And you see if there is an interaction between these two, uh, these two, these two perturbations. TMS can also be used to induce long-term changes. Uh, and for this, you have to use it in a repeated manner, right? So you, you, for let's say half an hour, you send a stimulation pulse either at low frequency around one hertz or high frequency around five hertz. And depending on the frequency, it will either increase the excitability of the brain area or, uh, or increase it. This has some clinical applications. So for example, in depression or neurogenic pain, it has some demonstrated uh, demonstrated effect. One question about this technique is how precise it is. Uh, and for this, of course, the coil shape has an influence, right? So in research, we use this figure of eight coils, which you see are able to generate an electrical field that is much narrower than, uh, than the circular coil. Uh, it's around one square centimeter uh, in the brain. And of course, as you saw, the coil placement method, so how you aim for an area in the brain, can be quite impre imprecise, right? If you hold the coil by hand, like we saw before. So you can have very crude methods, or if you want to do better, you have the subject take an, F an MRI scan, so you get the scan of their, uh, of their head, and then you use a motion tracking system uh, to be able to aim precisely where you want. And even currently, you have robotic systems that are kind of able to, to, track, uh, to track the head. Of course, this is also a field with its own uh, challenges and advances. So the challenges are, for example, just this noise, uh, the heating, right? If you do this repetitive TMS, the coil heats up. And sham, meaning that it's very hard to do fake TMS, which is quite important if you want to do double blind, uh, double blind experiments. There is also ongoing research to really understand what happens in the brain. So you have approaches of modeling this electrical field, for example, with finite element methods and, and models of the different cortical layers and surfaces, and modeling of the effects on neurons with, uh, with cable modeling. And you also have uh, studies uh, in order to, to try to shape the magnetic field. So either here to shape it in a dynamical way with several coils and be able to target different areas without moving the, the stimulation, or also to target deep brain areas without affecting the surface areas, which seems to be pretty, pretty hard to do. So in conclusion on these techniques, so you see here this graph that represents uh, a lot of neuroscience technique, depending on their temporal resolution from milliseconds to years, their spatial resolution from organ to molecule, and whether the techniques are correlative techniques or interference techniques. And you see that these magnetic techniques with M in them are, are pretty, are covering a large part actually of these, of these techniques. And so they are really important for neuroscience. We also saw that they had limitations, but what's important to remember is that it's that their biggest limitations are actually not coming from you, not coming from scientists, from physicists and engineers, they're coming from neuroscientists, right? We don't know well enough how they work to fully exploit them, right? So, I mean, of course, uh, technological progress is nice, but there needs to be progress in, in, in understanding how, how they work. And to finish, I know I, I said I would talk about magnetoception. Uh, I asked a, a friend who works in bird neuroscience about magnetoception, and she told me that it's actually a taboo subject because uh, there are a lot of fights between different, uh, between different teams. And since I'm out of time, I will keep with this tradition and not talk about magnetoception. I do have a backup slide, though. Thank you. Ah, okay. Matthias? Yeah, I'm used to see Matthias. Yes, go ahead.
Wait. Ouais, mon son, il est là, mais... Ok. Ok. Ah, no, no question then. <laughs> Ah. I wonder what you expect from this uh, EZ uh, MRI setup, because you said with the seven Tesla, you already have the spatial resolution. So is it just a matter of signal or noise or what do you expect? I'm not an expert in MRI, so yeah, I expect that the signal to noise ratio will become better and uh, and still the spatial resolution can increase uh, thanks to that. And since we're really at the borderline of these scales that I showed, right, these layers and, and columns, it will be really interesting to see what, uh, what we get there. Um, I think the increase of, of precision is also linked to some drawbacks of the technique. So it measures these vascular signals. And of course, in the brain, you have uh, vessel, blood vessels of different sizes, right? So at the tissue level, you have capillaries. And ideally, that's really what you want to measure, right? These very small vessels that are closest to the neurons. Uh, and, but then these capillaries join and form bigger and bigger veins. And in veins, since you, you have a lot of this deoxyhemoglobin, uh, this perturbs the signal a lot more. So I think with the increase of spatial accuracy, they also will be able to better separate this signal coming from the veins from the signal uh, of the capillaries. Uh, but my, my answer is probably not complete, but that's what I can say on this. Other questions? Uh, okay. En soi. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you. You mentioned that um, CMS has an impact on neurogenic pain and also on other things. Uh, what is the, the, the mechanism behind that? You, this is, a tr I, I'm not an expert at all. <laughs> So some studies on pain have actually been done here in Lille at the, at the CSU. Uh, from what I know, um, it seems that a lot of pain, uh, pain mechanisms are, are, right, you feel pain somewhere, they are localized, and there are strong interactions between the, the somatosensory system and the motor system, right? They are tightly linked. And it seems that by using this uh, repetitive TMS, which induces long-term changes in the brain, they see uh, a decrease of pain. So, I mean, I, I could explain a bit this idea between repeated TMS. Uh, so the idea is that, as was said before, right, in the, in the talk about the neuronal networks, um, neurons are connected together or they communicate through synapses. And of course, the brain has mechanisms to strengthen uh, these synapses or, or uh, lower their strength. Um, and basically, what is often described is, um, is the, the idea that neurons that fire together, so that if two neurons that are connected together are active together, this will strengthen the synapse because it means that it's a good synapse, right? That's what you would, you would want. And Hebbian uh, neural networks are based on this principle. Whereas if the firing is desynchronized, it, me it means that this synapse should decrease its, uh, its weight. And basically by um, stimulated repetitively an area uh, with these frequencies, you could either, um, either cause these mechanisms of increasing the synaptic weights or decreasing them. But that's really a very general uh, answer. We, we still don't really, I mean, we're not 100% sure, right? Okay, I have just um, a couple of questions. One is, um, okay, just uh, because you said that, that soon you will have the, the MRI machine with 11.7 Tesla. 
and I was always wondering what is the maximum admissible magnetic field for the human brain before it starts to disrupt things. I thought it was around about 10 Tesla, but maybe it's a misconception. <laughs> so, so they're running tests, I think, currently. Um, the, the biggest problem, it seems, uh, is actually bringing people close to the magnet. So once you're in there in the constant field, uh, and, and of course, if you don't have anything metallic in your body, you're, you're probably fine. But the problem is, as soon as you're moving through there, uh, you get in, induced electrical fields, uh, and most notably in the inner ear, right? So people get really strong vertigo. Uh, and and uh, this already happens with the seven Tesla uh, magnets. So they, they, they just move people really closely towards the towards the, the magnets. But I don't know. Yeah, I think they're doing tests currently. Uh, these are also a lot of safety tests about what happens if the magnet quenches and, and things like that. So they, they are being careful, thankfully. Okay, go, go ahead online. We cannot hear anything, so what's going on? Why? Maybe. Wait, if I use my computer? Wait. So I can read it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the text was, in terms of understanding the fMRI activation maps, do you have a scenario that also involves the activity of astrocytes? So astrocytes are other cells that you find in the brain and, um, and which are thought to, to be kind of neuron helper. Uh, of course, the, the, the mechanisms probably uh, also involve uh, astrocytes at the cellular level as cells that give signals to the to the blood vessels to dilate for example so that uh, this is not something i know i know precisely sorry but i know that research goes into studying the interactions between neurons and astrocytes and what mechanism in the neuron causes this activation to um, that ultimately leads to uh, to the increase in, in local blood flow Right, and so for magnetoception, this was the actual, uh, the two hypotheses. So that's why it's, it's a contested uh, subject. So the oldest hypothesis is about uh, just magnetite crystals in cells that would be just physically linked to ion channels. So when they move, you would get ion influx in the cells. And uh, the theory that has, that seems to be a bit more accepted now, but with less clear uh, cellular mechanisms would involve, uh, so this goes way beyond what I can understand, a radical pair that would be light activated. So with, with electron exchanges between two molecules and then two different molecules whose, uh, whose transition depends on uh, the magnetic field. Um, and this is what seems to uh, make people go in this direction is that first magneto sensation is light sensitive so if the animals don't have light or don't have light at a specific frequency it stop it stops working and also magnetoception is sensitive to certain radio frequencies and this would be explained in the magnetic pair hypothesis and not in the magnetite hypothesis but yeah people fight apparently 